Welcome to Sonic Dorms. My name is Max Davalo, and on today's show, I have a very special guest. I have Kevin Gilbert's state archivist, Wayne Perez, on the show. He's here today to discuss uh, a lot of really what this is about is about the life and music of Kevin Gilbert. And today we're just going to be talking about how that how that went about and how he was brought into all this. He does run the You Are Here, a Kevin Gilbert podcast on YouTube. It's fantastic. If anybody has any sort of um, questions or wants to get into the world of Kevin Gilbert and his various musical explorations, they can definitely check that out. And even it's great for the diehards as well. So with that being said, welcome to the show, Wayne. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me, Max. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, um, if you wouldn't mind, I just wanted to introduce you to um, your, your basically your gateway into the world of Kevin Gilbert. How did you come into this? How did you become the chief archivist of Kevin Gilbert's uh, estate when it comes to his music? If you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. Uh, well, I, I knew Kevin uh, back in Thud era, back in 95, uh, 94. And I was just met him as a fan and I was a photographer, so I started taking photos at his concerts, and he kind of caught on to it. And it's a pretty good compliment because he actually said that he liked the way I caught him live, and he was notorious for rejecting pretty much every photo that anyone showed him. So uh, we just kind of built a friendship from that, and he started inviting me to more shows and actually just hanging out more, and that's how our friendship built. Um, after he passed, uh, Nick DiVirgilio, who worked with him on many projects, um, started archiving a bunch of his uh, recordings over at Lawnmower and Garden Kevin's studio. And he did that for the better part of uh, 96, 97. And I took over probably in the early 2000s. Um, and Nick just transferred everything over and kind of logged everything as best he could. I went in and fine toothed everything, just went through and just checked to see what was there, what was not there, and kind of just logged everything for the estate. Not really for um, for releasing, per se, but just to kind of see what was in Kevin's archives. And um, from that, I mean, that's where we're at today. That that process for you, what was that like? Was it very, was it very easy? I'm sure it was very meticulous as a process, but was it easy to decipher and not necessarily decipher, but sear through all these things that he had stored away? Was it easy? Was it an easy process for you to get everything uh, together? Well, the initial run of archiving was done at Lawnmower and Garden Supply Studio, which was Kevin's studio in Pasadena. And yeah, all the machines that were utilized, so all the, the tapes uh, were transferred at that time and either put onto DAT or onto um, the waveform. And from there, we everything was logged. So what we're going through now is we find something that uh, we're going to release, let's say, like the, um, the, the giraffe re-release that we just did. Uh, so we'll just look in our log tapes, find out what tape number that is, go into the storage facility, grab the master if we need to, and run from there. If not, um, we have all of Kevin's mix downs already transferred digitally. So everything is pretty much in digital format already. But um, initially, I mean, it was a big undertaking because Kevin had everything in, in many different forms. He had quarter-inch tapes, two-inch tapes, uh, DAT, uh, DA88s. Uh, standard cassette tapes so it wasn't like there was just one format and just put it in a machine and let it and let it go um, it took a while and even now when we're going back through some of these uh, master tapes uh, some of these machines are difficult to locate now da88 machines are just so difficult to find so um, Kevin used any type of recording <laughs> tape that there was available um, any resource he could at the time so it's not uncommon that you'll find a giraffe master tape and at the end of it you'll find a song that was later used on thud or something like that so he just whatever had space at the end he utilized that 
when it comes to his history, when you said you, you first came into his world as a photographer, were you already familiar with his past work prior to that thud period or were you just coming in during that thud era as a new fan? No, I was a fan of Toy Matinee and okay. um, growing up in Southern California, listening to 95.5 KLOS, the local Los Angeles radio station, um, the uh, morning radio show, Mark and Brian, they took to Toy Matinee immediately and started playing cuts from it and had Kevin in the studio. And so I was a fan immediately once I heard that and uh, saw the shows locally, and, which I was fortunate to do because they only toured, you know, that one tour. Um, and that was it. Uh, and from that point on, I just kept uh, kept an eye out in the local newspapers and the and the music scene for any time Kevin's name came up, and uh, it was rare. And uh, a couple of years later, probably in 1992, I think he was on the Mark and Brian show again. He just dropped by, and he wanted to hear um, one of his songs that he'd been working on, so he put it on, and um, it was Best Laid Plans, an early version of it that later came out in the Shaming of the True, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'll always remember that. I, I remember I told him I pulled over on the side of the road. I know exactly where I was when I heard that. And um, I called the radio station and he had just left because I was just wanted to know what, you know, what's, what are you doing now that toy matinee is not around. So uh, it was about a year and a half later that uh, I finally started to see his name floating around shows in, in LA. So I started to go seeing him uh, with his thud band. The, uh, what do you think of, Kevin Gilbert, as far as like, if you wouldn't mind sharing some, some of your, your insights on just his history and his, like his trajectory, because he has a very interesting career as far as like his origin story going through to what he did in the eighties with giraffe and then leading into toy man and, and such. I think it's a very interesting. He, he, uh, for, for, you know, within his life he just to me he did so he accomplished so much within his 29 years and i find that very interesting do you know where his musical roots lied in because i know he was a big fan of prog of course i mean he did lambs like uh lamb lies down on broadway with giraffe in 94 and such but um he also had a really distinct singer songwriter almost like he had a real soul to his voice his songwriting was impeccable um, there was just something, he, he was very complex and multifaceted, I would say, as a musician, instrumentalist. Where do you think that all stems from? I was just from, I, I think, just being a sponge. Um, yeah. He, accepting music and loving music at an early age, but at the same time, he also liked um, such music as coming out from Burt Bacharach. Things like the things that you wouldn't think of. Um, but then when you hear some of his influences, you'll go back and say, wow, I can hear some Burt Bacharach in there. And, uh, you know, a lot of his themes, a lot of uh, show tunes, everything like that. So while he grew up, he jumped into many different forays of music. Prague, progressive music was a big, big, big thing for him. But there were, you know, he loved certain pop hits that were out that he just you know he wanted to emulate them he wanted to have a pop hit uh whether it was for just having a hit having his name out there who knows but um but his roots lie like i said with this as a sponge he soaked everything up do you think that was his constant um i don't want to use the word battle but do you think that was just like his his goal was ultimately to be recognized and have that hit and, and just be seen because to me, he was so talented. And, and, um, that's, that's a big part of why any chance I get, I, I try to share his music with uh, as many people as possible just because I think he's such a talented songwriter and, and instrumentalist and one of a kind, I put him up there with, uh, to me, he was a prodigy of sorts. Yeah. Um, in speaking with a lot of his friends, knowing a lot of his friends and knowing him to a degree, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't really answer that question. It's, it's, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's an open-ended thing there. I, you know, I, I mean, let me ask you, what do you feel as a fan? I going through literally from 
NRG all the way through to Thud, and uh, I, mean, in, I mean, beyond that, what he did with Cavi with the Caviar Project, um, I do believe he was someone who, for as talented as he was, he his one of his biggest goals, and to me, was to have that big pop hit. Uh, I be, maybe to a degree that became like almost like an albatross because he he was just to me determined, and it almost became like a like a struggle, but. To, to not be recognized, even though he had worked so hard and he had, and he had basically like put in all this effort into everything that he did. You could tell he put 150% effort. He was probably one of the most talented uh, of, of his time, of his era. Um, and to this day, I mean, you listen to the, how complex his music is, even something as simplistic as uh, Goodness Gracious off of Thud. I mean, even that song itself to me is still relevant today and it just showcases his genius. And uh, so to me, it, it's almost, um, it's, it's very interesting, but I, I believe like no matter what he, uh, I mean, those who discover him, I think that's the beauty of it at the end of the day. To me, he's, he's someone that maybe, you know, had he lived, perhaps he would have gotten that who maybe not, but regardless to me, he had a lot of credibility with his peers. And to me, that matters more than anything. The fact that, right. he, yeah. And I wanted you to, uh, you to initially answer it because um, it's very important for the, the fan aspect to, to, to try to understand on their own, on your own, what Kevin was going for without, you know, people, Kevin's not here to answer. So you know, we're, we're taking my word and friends and at times family's word. And, you know, you won't get the same answer from everyone. Let's just say that. Um, Kevin started off early in a recording studio. He was fortunate enough to, to work in a recording studio and use the tools of a recording studio to propel forward. His demos weren't the normal demos that you would find in any, you know, in, in any musical career out there. His demos were multi-track demos or studio demos. So when we were fortunate that we can listen to all of Kevin's music from the time he was about 14 years old, all the way to when he was 29. And we get that, that 15 years of, of studio work and we see a hit there. We see a hit in 1985. We see a hit in 1986, 87. We see that through his career. He didn't see that. What he saw were hits, but he was never happy with them, whether it, it was because no one else saw them as a hit because they weren't released commercially to be a hit, who knows, but he kept reforming those. And in the course of his, his music career, the ups and downs of the music career helped formulate those versions. So by the time you got into the shaming of the true, um, Songs that were, were originally done in 1985, 1986 were at times drastically different or had different lyrics. And those at times reflected what Kevin experienced. So was he al always chasing a hit? Doesn't every musician want to have their name out there? I mean, you know, Kurt Cobain's famous for saying, you know, I didn't want to be famous. I didn't want all this stuff. And I didn't want to, you know, all this stuff. Well, you, you could have went back and just locked yourself up and just never been out. So it's one of those things that I'm sure everyone who's, who's out on stage wants that recognition. I mean, that's why you have your, your song, your name on song credits and, you know, as producer, arranger, anything like that. So the amount of success Kevin had, I think by the time that um, 1996 came around and Caviar was, was happening, I think he was understanding the amount of success that he did achieve at that time. And with Caviar, Caviar was in turn a collective. It was a group that was meeting similar to the Tuesday Music Club. Mm -hmm. They were meeting to, to form a band or form songs and compose and have fun. And if you were in the room right there when they wrote this over here, then your name got put on it. So he had come full circle. A lot of people wanna say that, um, that he was depressed, he was miserable in 96, you know, at 29 years old. And, you know, all of us who were around him at the time say, no, that wasn't the case. He was, he was happy with the trajectory going forward and he was working on completing the shaming of the true and caviar was pretty much buttoned up. So he was getting ready to, to do those things. So, so shaming of the true and caviar were done 
almost simultaneously in a way, right? Around the same time period, he was gearing both projects up in a way, or is that well, how the that shaming of, The yeah. Shaming of the True is an ongoing project, you know, from the early 90s. And so that was always being touched on and, and tapered with and, and messed with all through the years, through the 90s. And when Caviar was, was formed, Caviar wasn't really formed as let's form this band right here, right now. The, the embryo, the, 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 the fetus of Caviar was born out of the Tuesday Music Club sessions back in 92 and in 93. And some of those uh, songs from back then ended up becoming Caviar songs. And through the course of the years, Brian McLeod, who uh, was a drummer in Tuesday Music Club and through a lot of Kevin's stuff, Kevin and, and Brian formed kind of like a duo and they kept going from Tuesday music club as this duo through, and they had a band called Ketamen, which it wasn't a band. It was just two guys. They released a song that, but like I said, that was kind of under the caviar collective. And so it was going under the understanding that, that they were going to be doing these songs for people and for themselves and everything. And at one point they just said, let's, let's just do a band. Let's just have fun and be a band. And that's, that was how caviar got established. I, I bring caviar up specifically because to me, it's probably one of the more enigmatic Kevin Gilbert projects. And because it came towards the end, uh, there's not a lot of information. I don't feel I've read some interviews, uh, but I, I haven't, I've, gotten as much insight into that project as I would like to. So do you specifically know why Kevin decided to go for the sound and the aesthetic that he went for as far as visually, sonically for something like Caviar, which is so distinctive from literally everything else in his catalog? Right. And you have to, you have to, you have to put it back towards the, the time frame that it was too. So Back in 1995, 96, when Caviar was was really being, you know, formed, um, what type of music like that was out there? What was heavy at the time? Uh, ministry? Were Ministry out there doing kind of like this semi stuff like that? Marilyn Manson wasn't out there, so the 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 heaviness of it. This was just something that naturally progressed in some of their music. Um, Brian McLeod goes to say many times that um, when, when they were in Tuesday Music Club sessions, it would kind of dissolve, dissolve into some, you know, weird political talking and a couple of the guys would go in one corner and, you know, be arguing about something over here. And Kevin and Brian would just be sitting there as the, the young pups and say, we just want to play music. And they would just sit there and do music. And that's how the ghetto beautiful things was and and pretty and so so that's how it started and that's that's where it came from so the concept of of the gas mask kevin wanted to sing in a gas mask he was actually trying to figure out how to wire a microphone into a gas mask um and part of it was because uh he didn't want anybody to know that it was kevin gilbert up on stage Caviar was going to be a band and he was going to have a persona known as the bug man. And so this, this, this gas mask was going to be his disguise that was going to shield him and no one was going to be able to see who he was. And you were just going to con concentrate on the concept of what caviar is. So you wouldn't be looking up there saying, all right, Kevin Gilbert, let me hear your songs. You'd be looking up there saying, this is caviar. And because it was going to be a band. It wasn't just going to be one person's name. So um, so he also didn't want to alienate some of his fan base. He didn't want his fan base to go, wait a minute. <laughs> you just saying when you give your love to me on this album and a year and a half later, you're over here, you know, singing this other stuff with a gas mask and wearing all this latex. So it was it was a very fine line that he was trying to establish there between the singer songwriter phase of his career and where he might go with this. Now was caviar going to be a one and done album and tour and, and all that, who knows I mean, if it would have caught on, who knows what could have happened right now. We could have been seeing, you know, caviar stadium tours for all we know. Right. Um, we just don't know. So 
So when people say, what would Kevin be doing now? It's really unknown because of what he was doing then. He had his hand in, in a bunch of avenues. He was producing. He was doing his own music with the Shaming of the True stuff and with Caviar. To go back a little bit, remember, he was doing Shaming of the True all through the 90s, like I said. And, and you asked, when was Caviar spe you know, specified? Right. Um, he was, at the end, he was doing them both simultaneously. Um, from studio logs and, and, and notes and all that in his uh, calendar, the studio calendar. Um, for example, in the month of May 96, um, he was mixing for Spock's Beard. He was writing for Caviar. And he was doing um, sessions, going to be doing sessions for a band called Dog Park and also for the Rubenews. So and if you look at all those bands, all those musicians, it's all over the place as far as music genre. So um, what would he be doing now? Who knows? But back then, um, I was really geared for Caviar because he had let me know that he didn't let me know it was called Caviar. Um, they didn't know what the band was going to be. And they went through a bunch of different names for the band. And uh, we'll reveal those pretty soon. They're pretty interesting. And um, some are pretty X-rated. So I don't know how, how much we can re reveal. Right. But, um, but I remember him telling me, he said, you know, I come from more of a background of, a, you know, more into hard rock and metal. And so um, he came at me with, you know what, you, I'm not going to play you this stuff when, it, when I'm ready to. You're going to love this. This is the stuff you're going to really love. And I love the singer songwriter stuff, you know, and he often was saying like, ah, why do you like my music? It's nothing like any of the other stuff you do. You know, it doesn't sound like Dio, you know, no Ronnie yeah. James Dio there. but um, but it's, it is what it is, you know, you can't help it when you, when you catch on to something that you like. So that's about that. Is, is that the, the bug man persona? Was that tied to why he decided to lower the pitch of his vocals on a lot of these songs on, on the caviar project? Well, yeah, that was part of the, that was part of the gimmick. That was part of what caviar was going to be having, you know, it wasn't supposed to be Kevin Gilbert. So you weren't supposed to listen to that and go, Oh wait, that's, yeah, that's Kevin. I mean, if you caught on to it and heard that it was him, then fine. And it wasn't going to be like he was, you know, his name was going to be in the in the album and all that stuff. It wasn't going to be like it was some super secret thing, like, you know, like Kiss, you weren't able to know who they were without makeup or something. But it was just something that that initially, it, you want to jump on stage and, you know, if Paul McCartney says he's going to be on stage as Paul McCartney, everyone's going to look at Paul McCartney they're not going to really focus on everyone else initially. They're there to see Paul McCartney. Now you throw caviar on there with a gas mask and you throw, have 50, hundred people in the room. They don't know who's singing that song with a gas mask. They just are listening to the music and the vocals and seeing the performance. So it, it's really where your mind takes you. And so the concept of performing with a gas mask and everything like that, it's a pretty interesting one. It's pretty, I mean, it's been done before. I mean, you know, you have bands, uh, Green Green Jelly, they perform with big old, you know, pieces on you, or, you know, Slipknot, they have masks on. Um, so it's not that it hasn't been done, but it would be a very interesting concept, especially back in 96. Absolutely. You, you mentioned, uh, just to add to that really quick, the fact that he had his hands in so many different projects in that period of time. Where does, where did, Thud, or the, the songs that he was trying to accumulate for Thud, where does that fall into all this? Because I know that album went through various variations, like for a little bit, like he had different track listings, I believe, for, for that record. How, how long was that period of time where that he was working on that? Uh, for Thud? How long was he working on Thud? Yeah. Um, well, once again, it's it's a very difficult answer to give because in, in Kevin's timeline to actually equate a start date. Um, it's very difficult because some of these songs were thought up in, in the eighties. And so I guess you can say when he, after toy matinee dissolved and he realized he was going to put out a solo album, I guess that's when toy matinee or thud began. So that would fall into around 1990, 91. Uh, 
the first song he recorded for for thud was a tired old man which appears on on the cd nuts and the original version of appears on the call me kai for cd set that we just released and so in, in 1986 he released a tired old man to friends and family and what eight years later he releases or he was set to release it on thud now it was the first song he recorded for thud but it was also the first song that he removed from thud when he went to go do his track listings so so i guess you can say thud started in 91 but did the core start from 86 <laughs> because that's when he originally right. you know so it's very difficult to figure that out but but you can kind of a lot of things overlap let's just say there's things that are you know there's track listings that list songs for thud and shaming of the true inner spliced interwoven it's it's shaming of the true has no less than 10 different track listings um with songs from throughout all of kevin's career that's the best i can describe it um on the call me kai cd set that we released some of those songs we're going to be on a version of shaming of the true he just never got around to do it but he did write down different summaries different notes different um ideas of where he wanted to take shaming of the true interesting and so with that being said i have to say this packaging is probably one of my favorite probably my favorite of the kevin gilbert releases by the estate i mean to me, this is a beautiful packaging. I love everything that was put into this. I love the fact that you actually went out of your way to recreate the studio tape, the Ampex studio tape sort of design yeah. with Kevin Gilbert's actual handwriting reprinted here. From To me, this is why I believe in buying physical product because of things like this. How, like, to me, like, is this like, what is the process of putting something like this together? Like the fact that you put so much detail, it, this is a beautiful package. And uh, I recommend it to any diehard fan or anybody who just wants to get to know him, but very lavish. Does this take a long time to produce? Is it, is it a very meticulous process for you to put something like this together? Another complex answer, yes and no. Um, the packaging is one thing, the material is another. So the media, the, the audio on that, um, if we start there, uh, just to be, so everyone knows, we originally pulled these out and started readying them for release in 2014. So when in 2014, I went back into the archives and I, I sort of re-archived everything. I went back in and, um, I just wanted to make sure that we got everything. And sure enough, I found some stuff that we had missed or that had been missed throughout the years. Uh, things that had been mislabeled, things that had, uh, at the time, people who were going through it didn't know what they were. And so they labeled them certain things. Um, in 2014, we had John Cunaberti, who uh, does all of Kevin Gilbert's audio work, uh, mastering it all. It was great at that uh, he went ahead and and mastered all these excuse me hold on <clears throat> a little clear throat there so um he went ahead and, and mastered all these for release but it wasn't the right time to release it at that time we were releasing uh thud at the time um the lamb i believe was um in 2015 and also toy matinee acoustic hold on. so uh, we readied these, and from that point on, I started to research these even more than I had already done. Since now they were going to be put for for sale or put for release in some way, whether they were going to be digital or not, um, or physical release, we went ahead and uh, I started to research them, find, try to find as many credits as it was and instrumentation, anything that we could um, to go ahead and do set for release. So it's taken about this time. It's taken a good five, six years to get everything going. And so the process then goes to, to then remaster them, <laughs> remaster something that hasn't been released. So uh, John Cunaberti, because there's new elements available, 
sat with the master tapes again and mastered them. And they came out even better, what I didn't think could happen. And so once those were done, um, I was done with my research as much as we could be. And then it was left to the art department. How do we present this? Well, these that CD set that you that you showed, it's four CDs and it's culled over the period of 1985 to 1987. And in that three and a half year span, um, there's not a lot to to get from Kevin's career from back then. He was in high school for a portion of the, he was just coming out of high school. And I mean, people, if you have photos of them, we don't have them. <laughs> and so one odd thing was, you know, I spend a lot of time in the storage facility. And so I'm looking at all those master tapes, all those Ampex, you know, all those scotch reels, everything like that. So forever, as I've been thinking about this, I just had the idea, why don't we, why don't we package it all as if it was in Kevin's studio and you went and reached for that shelf that had all the Kai era years, you opened it up. It would have photos of, it would be like a keepsake, everything that he would have in it. So it's got his photos. It's got his reels. It's got everything you could need in one, one box there, one package. So, um, I came up with a little mock-up, which you see right there. And, um, John Rubin, the executor of Kevin's estate, uh, who executive produces everything, goes over everything. Um, he liked it and said, all right, let's do it. So Hugh Brown, who does all the, the final artwork for the estate, uh, he went through and, and finalized all the artwork, which came out beautifully. You know, I went to the storage facility. I took photographs of all the master tapes and uh, we scanned all of Kevin's, you know, track listings that he had for, for every disc. So. So it worked out well. I mean, there's actually a couple of, um, I should say maybe two little kind of Easter eggs, a little couple of details that so far I haven't seen anybody pick up on on the packaging. There's two of them. And um, I believe, yeah, there's two. So I just received this uh, about two days ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm still going through the entire set and, and, and putting everything together in my mind. So uh, it's not even the audio. It's just in the packaging. The packaging There's a I'm have to check that out. Um, yeah. But I love that it's got his writing. There's even a little note about uh, one of the tracks on the record and how at yeah. the time James Brown's uh, Living in America was a huge <laughs> thing and Born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen was a big song. So his, you know, quote unquote USA song, he was uh, saying, hey, this should be a hit as well, which again shows just how I mean, I take it that he was he had a really witty, uh, just a great sense of humor about everything, including himself, it seems like. Uh, at yeah. Least and, you know, it, you mentioned about using his handwriting in the packaging. Um, I also did that for the Toy Matinee Acoustic CD uh, that we released back in 2015. And me personally, as a fan, um, I look at it as if I were receiving a package, uh, a new release you know, Kevin's not here. And so anything that we release, we're releasing under the theory that he would approve of it. Well, what more can he approve of his handwriting? Um, and a fan gets a little bit of him at the same time. So it's, to me, it's a little bit more of a personal touch. Now the CD set that you own there, when you flip that over, it, it has all of his handwriting in it. Now, right. those are just the, the notes of the names of the songs. When you put the actual disc in, your computer or um, your CD player should read the, the actual title. We've actually encoded them with the actual title on there. For example, I think Mixed Bag has B-Men 1 and B-Men 2. Technically, the full name on that is B-Men Theme 1, B-Men Theme 2. So for all those people out there, a lot of Kevin Gilbert fans like those little details. You know, we didn't want... It would have been enormous packaging to include another list of all the actual, you know, titles. Right. So it was kind of the, that executive decision of, you know what, let's just use Kevin's writing. Let's just look, you know, give everybody like if this is his tape, giving it to you. Yeah, I, I love it. And what I really, I mean, just there's a, a song that I really love off of Shaming the True called Staring into Nothing. 
and you hear what I believe would be the original version of that, which hails back to, uh, you know, the mid eighties. I, I think I thought that was incredible to listen to some of these songs in their original state, uh, nearly 10 years maybe before they uh, came out or were re-recorded for later purposes. I, I think that's amazing. And again, it goes back to what you said earlier about how throughout his career, he would sort of repurpose certain tracks depending on what the project he considered, he figured the project would call for or what it needed at that time. Right. And, and Staring Into Nothing is an interesting track because that actually appeared in uh, NRG mm -hmm. and then it goes into Call Me Kai. There's two versions in there, 1985, 87. And then what you're talking about in Shaming of the Truth. So when you get all these versions and you compare them and you cross compare them, um, a lot of people sometimes will look at this and say, well, why am I going to buy his Kevin's music if Staring Into Nothing is repeated four times throughout his these discs? But each one is different. And although you may listen to it initially, especially in an automobile or, you know, out by the pool or something like that, not on a great sound system, it's going to sound like the same song overall. But when you really put on headphones, when you sit and really appreciate, you will hear different mixes. You will hear different things. You will hear his voice panned a little different. And so a lot of these releases are for the diehards to go on, to put on and, and cross compare and see the trajectory of Kevin's career and see where he was formulating those songs and what he liked in 1985 with staring into nothing and what he liked in 1987, what he liked in 1996. So it, it's interesting to, to almost do a kind of Kevin Gilbert music theory class and just kind of put everything on and just go through the different versions, you know, I think, and that's what I love about these, this four CD set and the giraffe set. It's a ton of music. It's, yeah. These this, are four albums. I got the wallet uh, set, which is fantastic as well. And uh, again, lavish packaging and uh, kudos to you and the, and the estate for putting something like this together. Now, and, and there's a certain way to open that package too. There, there's there's a, a method to the madness on that um, to open the, the giraffe wallet. When you open the giraffe wallet, the front shows you giraffe. Flip it over, it shows you proud suggestion. And that's the first album. When you hold it like that and you flip it up, it shows you the second album, which is the view from here. Right. Then you turn it sideways and it's the DVD. So it's actually in a progression that it was, oh, that it was made. <laughs> it's fantastic. There's little, there's little things like that, that we've been putting in and um, for the fans, all, all these releases are for the fans. I just want to say, if you don't have your Kevin Gilbert CDs, it's not a music play. Go get them because uh, the estate is liquidating all of Kevin Gilbert's hard media from inventory. So in other words, whatever's manufactured and up for sale, it will not be repressed. So um, there will be no other and uh, other editions of, of them. That's it. So the giraffe wallet that you're holding right there, that's it. Once the giraffe wallet's gone, there will be no giraffe CDs manufactured. Uh, same thing with Call Me Kai. Once that 40 CD set's gone, it, that's it. There's not going to be any more. Um, we've gotten some flack back on it. Like, well, why? This stuff should be, you know, carried forever. Unfortunately, after you sell X amount out of the gate, you have stock that just sits there. And Kevin Gilbert's music continuously sells, but it kind of bleeds through. It kind of just, you know, trickles out. So look up all his catalog numbers. That's a lot of music to keep in stock just for people to randomly choose to buy. So all the releases that are coming out right now, they're considered for the fans 100%. So as a fan, I love it because I want, I want that, that CD set that you're holding up right there. I want that wallet set because as a fan, I still want a physical copy. You know, I have all of this stuff here. I have, I have his whole catalog here and, but I don't have the fan aspect of it. I don't have, you know, the artwork and stuff. And there are times when I do want to sit down in my studio here and look through the artwork, even if I've been a part of it and just appreciate what the music was surrounding that artwork. And so hopefully we give that to the fans with, with the packages that are coming and um, the things that have been released so far. 
Um, the estate tries not to, you know, put a big price tag out there. It's not the intent to sell something for a huge profit. A lot of people think, you know, we, I see some comments, I should say, not a lot of people, but I see some comments saying, you know, I guess it's just about the money when you guys release certain things or why did we, we not re like with the call me Kai, why didn't release, we release a 24 page booklet with it. Why does, you know, why? Well, if someone can fill a 24 page booklet from the years 85 through 87 for Kevin Gilbert, I would love that content because it's just not there. Right. So, so basically when you get a Kevin Gilbert package now or a CD release, when you open it, that's what's there. That's what's available. And that's, you know, what can be released. So um, it's not a, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you, but it, it's kind of going through with a mentality and an understanding that, you know, we're doing the best to try to pack as much into something that we can. And I think the call me Kai CD set, you know, it packs a pretty good punch for everybody. You're going to have tons of, I mean, one CD a day will take you, you know, it's going to take you two weeks to go to listen twice through. So it's a lot of music there. It's a lot of fun stuff too. Yeah. I mean, I, I was up till probably 3 a.m. just uh, going at least a couple hours, just getting through the first couple disc and of the Call Me Kai set. And, and uh, again, I, I try to listen to everything on a, on a fantastic pair of headphones and try to get all those little details out of the Sonics uh, and it's really well worth worth it, I believe, especially if you're a huge fan of his. But um, with that being said, can Kevin Gilbert fans look forward to um, any any more in the future? As far as like I have heard about his music, these some of these releases coming onto streaming platforms at some point. Is that still a possibility? Yeah, streaming um, NRG right now is available you know, in most of the streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of put out there as a, as a feeler, just to kind of see how the streaming world was and everything like that. Um, since Kevin Gilbert's music is very, you know, in, in a boutique kind of atmosphere and it's not known widely, then the process is to liquidate as much media, hard media, as much as possible to then transition into streaming platforms. So, Throughout the course of the next months and early years upcoming, you're going to be seeing a lot of Kevin Gilbert streaming happening and uh, downloads, digital downloads. Uh, right now, we are formulating a plan, or actually it's in progress, on um, redoing his catalog as much as possible to release in a streaming way. Um, Giraffe will come out probably you know, once most of the units are liquidated and gone through and same thing with call me Kai. Now, um, the shaming of the true LP that is right now we're, we're working on that. And we have a big announcement coming up, uh, probably, I don't know when this airs, but you know, in early May about that. And we've been working on that better part of a year. So that's, that's an ongoing project. Um, as far as anything else, um, there might be one or two things in the future as far as uh, releases coming up. We're still evaluating what's going on. Um, we're going to start crowdfunding again. And what that is, I don't know if you saw, did you, were, did you see any of the crowdfunding uh, campaigns? That Absolutely. We did? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to start that again. And um, again, that that's strictly for the fans and it's not to fleece anybody. It's not to, to take anybody's money and run. Um, all that money that is generated and all the profit generated from that is put right back into these releases. Um, so, you know, autographs, Kevin autographs, you don't find those nowadays. And we have some in his, you know, in storage. And so um, we've gone through, I've gone through and, and kind of pulled out a bunch of things, track sheets, lyric sheets, you know, things that I think the fans would really like. Um, some of the track sheets that appear in that uh, giraffe and call me Kai set, we're going to put those for sale. So some, someone can actually have the track sheet that was used there. Um, and now I want to tell you something about the crowdfunding. You have the giraffe set right there, right? Yeah. Uh, the wallet set. When you open it up, you'll see that the, the, the back um, print, it, it's all colored. It's yellow and it's, it's a giraffe print. Mm -hmm. The crowdfunding gave us the ability to fill color into the packaging on the inside 
because they charge additional for that at the manufacturer. So the crowdfunding was able for us to flood the gutters, as they say, with, with art and color without transferring that cost to the consumer. So we ate the cost because of the crowdfunding campaign and you guys got a better product. We all got a better product because of it. So, and the price didn't go up. So ultimately what you're telling me is all this, the, the crowdfunding, everything goes into the product at the end of the day. It's all mm -hmm. about making the bet, the product as great as possible for the fans. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when it's a very big undertaking to continue to keep Kevin Gilbert going as far as Kevin Gilbert.com, you know, there's right, right off the bat, Kevin Gilbert.com. And that's web space. You got to have, um, you have an administrator, you have, you know, we have a storage facility that's housing all his, his recordings and belongings. So there's, there's continuous money that needs to be put out. And when you don't have an artist that's touring or that's making, you know, out there shaking hands, kissing babies, doing all this stuff, you you don't have uh, money coming in. So it's only music. It's only CDs at that point and songwriting, songwriting royalties. So, um, so when we put out these releases, each release is basically funding the other, the next one and, and so on and so forth. So that's why you see a lot of these piggyback together. That's why a lot of these releases come in clumps is because we can start a project. And then when that one gets released, we know, okay, it's going to break even because these projects are going to carry each other. So, so that's kind of how it's run. And it's, it's not some mastermind project behind the scenes over here that's just you know how can how can we fiend money from fans it's, right. it's not like that at all and i think the price tags on a lot of these releases you know are out there uh, for example if you go to the website you can right now you can get a giraffe sticker from 1988 in kevin's storage we found a sealed box of all his promotional stickers from giraffe you know with the receipts and everything from where he got them copied everything so you know these giraffe cds go for original CDs go for, you know, over $250, $300. We could have easily put these stickers decals on for 50 bucks each. People would have bought them. But what, why? That's, that's, there's no point in that. So we put them up for sale for $5 each. So someone can go and get a 1988 vintage sticker for $5. And where can you do that? Right, <laughs> you know, where right. can you go get something from 1988 right now online for five bucks? You know, that's a collectible. Yeah, again, it, sh it just shows how, to me, th this is so well done and, and it's done with the utmost respect. Uh, it, it's To me, it's transparent just how much respect and uh, it's, is put into these releases and everything that you do for Kevin Gilbert. Uh, it, 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 it's just for me, to me, it, it really is like it comes off as a major labor of love. And yeah, well, thank, I mean, and it's, you know, the entire team, there's a team of four basic primaries that, that that are behind the scenes with these and John Rubin's the executive producer and the executor of the state. Um, I do a lot of the arc, obviously the archiving and I produce a lot of the material that you see. I'm kind of like the, the PR guy around here. And um, John uh, Cunaberti does the audio and Hugh Brown does a lot of the artwork. So between us four, the biggest thing about it is that we don't have egos that are driving us. The only thing that are driving us is or is Kevin Gilbert's name and to put out a, a product that would be good for his name that he would be proud of. And so it's very important that you work with people who aren't first and foremost with putting their name out there. Um, in fact, there's a lot, I wouldn't say a lot, there's a few Kevin Gilbert products out there right now that don't have my name on that I had a hand in producing. And, uh, you know, in, in, a lot of the giraffe products, we didn't put our names in it because we wanted to keep those pure. We wanted to keep those what they were um, and some certain other releases you'll find out there. But um, I think that's a very, very important part of Kevin Gilbert's um, legacy here is that you have people working on it who aren't putting their their name first and foremost and, and primary. You know, when, when I do the, um, the You Are Here podcast, my name's not associated with it. You know, the only time you see my name is in the opening credit and that's it. It's, it's not about it. You know, uh, it's not about me. It's about Kevin's name and it's about 
what he was about and the friends and family, you know, who, who support him and who are still out there with him, you know, internally. Yeah. And one last thing before I let you go, is there any possibility? I don't know if it's because of um, the label that it was on at the time, but will there ever be a possibility of a toy matinee re-release with that kind of lavish packaging and, and outtakes and whatnot at some point in the future? I'm sure there, there will be, um, who puts it out, uh, who's behind it. That's another question. Um, you know, recently there's been a huge resurgence with Kevin Gilbert's music. I don't know what that's attributed to. I don't know if it's because of the pandemic and people have had time to sit there and go through their collections and be online and, and find, you know, our web show or whatever. Um, but it's great. And, uh, in turn, they found toy matinee again. And what's, what's really good is that people are out there and they're investigating this stuff. When people are searching for toy matinee, they're also searching for Kevin Gilbert and vice versa. So everybody in the toy matinee family is being taken care of in that sense. Now, will something surface in the future? Who knows who will release it? That's the next question. When we release thud, um, we only had one shot to do it. We had to license that from PRA records. PRA records was the label company that uh, Kevin Gilbert released thud under and they own thud. So we had tried for years to obtain the license and it was just out of reach for, for what we wanted to do. And finally in um, November of 2014, uh, we acquired the license and it was a one and done deal. We had one shot to do this. So that's when it was established. Okay, we're going to, you know, the license is for vinyl and for CD. So we're going to do this, do it right. And that's it. And we did. We got everything we could. And um, that was my baby. That was my, my, I had been working on that probably for the better part of 10 years, uh, just because Thud was when I met Kevin. And, you know, I love that album. Um, so um, I had been always, sitting on the side waiting for us to get those rights and i was just okay i know what songs are going to be there i know what we're going to do and and it just all fell into place once that happened um for everything else toy matinee um someone can re-release it someone can can get the rights to re-release it would it have the touch of the artists who were a part of it no it would just be released and that's it so any special edition or anything like that would have to have the artists or people who were involved a part of it. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, the best thing to do is to leave it to the people behind the scenes and not telling you, I'm just saying in general, right. um, you know, people get an idea and say, you know, Hmm, it'd be great to have a special edition of toy matinee out, maybe on vinyl or maybe a, you know, three disc set or something. All of these things we've all thought about. It's they're they're not they're no new ideas. Let's just say, um, one guy emailed me at, saying that the Call Me Kai CD set was his idea and that we should be giving him credit. That he emailed in a few years ago and said, "Hey, why don't you release these albums that Kevin used to send to his friends back in the '80s?" and you know, we have a standard reply that we do, you know, thank you and stuff like that. But it's, we know what's in the archives and we know what's there and we know what can be released. We know what can't be released and we know what's available too. So uh, there's a lot of things that legally can't be released. Tuesday night music club stuff, you know, um, obviously certain outtakes of toy matinee. So it's not that we don't want to, it's that if it's going to happen, it's going to be in time and it's going to be through the right avenues. Right. Uh, thanks for that. And, and why, do you, why do you think generations to come should continue to listen to, to Kevin Gilbert's music and continue to, to discover his, his, his catalog? Why do you why, what, do you, what do you think Kevin Gilbert can still bring to generations to come and new fans? Oh, I mean, the Beatles didn't do it all. There's still Kevin Gilbert 
and there's still a world of music out there. Um, he would have given us hopefully a ton more, but what we have there, um, I think there's a lot to be discovered for generations to come. And what we're doing with releasing everything as we are uh, currently and then transforming into digital, I think there's going to be a lot of new fans who are going to take in what we have given them and what Kevin gave. And I think they're going to understand and be able to decipher and pick through and understand where he was here musically, just like we have. The difference with us is, or I should say me and fans who've been there for the, for the long haul, is we got this stuff through the years. I envy someone like you who, you know, you're grabbing all this stuff and this is, this is your fresh ears. You're hearing this for the first time. You get to stay up till 3 a.m. doing this, you know, for the first time. And I envy that because those are the time, those are the special times. Those are the ones that you think back and go, yes, I remember that. I remember looking at that CD for the first time. And, and that's what we want. That's, that's, those stories are the ones that we want to read online and we want to other people to read because those are the memories now. You know, back then in, in the 70s and 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, we, we had vinyl. We sat there. We listened on headphones. We had sound systems and stuff like that. So music has escaped a lot, the art form of music and and the big um, wait, alarm there and the big. Um, hold on there. Doors. The big um, the big bombastic effect of, of just music is, is gone the, the listening element and it's kind of coming back now and you know people are into vinyl again and even some people are into cassettes again um but i think his music is just it's it's going to be there forever and it's going to continue and people are going to be able to you know 100 years from now pull out dusty old cds and if they work they're going to be able to listen and go like oh yeah i know what that's about you know it, i think it's just going to transcend the time yeah, beautifully said. Uh, if anyone wants to check out You Are Here, a Kevin Gilbert podcast, which you are on uh, and you're the curator of, fantastic podcast. I believe you're only six episodes in at this point, correct? Yeah, we have, um, just so people know, I mean, you know, it, they're not on a schedule. They're just, they're. we actually have two or three in the can right now that have, are in the editing stage and stuff like that. And you know, it's, it's kind of, as we do, we're packing them with a bunch of content as much as we can. So sometimes we're waiting on video or waiting to transcode to, to get some audio in and clean things up and all that. So, um, the response has been great. So it's just make sure you watch them. A lot of people listen to these pod or video podcasts. I, I would recommend you definitely watch them because when you watch them, you're going to see a lot of, uh, visual content that's, that you're not going to get from just listening. Yeah, again, I mean, I've, I've loved every episode. And if anyone wants to get more into the Call Me Kai set, the latest episode gets uh, deeply into everything involving the Call Me Kai set. I, that's probably uh, my favorite thus far. Just because Yeah, we're going to have, there, there's, a, there's an episode that, um, there's two episodes that I'm recording within the next couple of weeks that are turning out to be my babies. They're going to be some... I, these ones are going to, when they get released, I'm going to be sitting there just proud of these guys. So um, I'm proud of all the other ones and they've been great so far, but um, the content and the multimedia that we're going to provide in these next ones are, it's, I think it's going to blow some people away. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy that you've brought on, you know, members of giraffe, you brought on Nick DiVergilio, which again, fantastic that you're bringing uh, the Kevin Gilbert alumni, so to speak into the picture and again, a very well-crafted uh, podcast. You can tell, again, there's a lot of attention and a lot of uh, a lot put into it. And, and again, that's it's it's authentic, to say the least. Yeah, thanks. I so, appreciate it. Thank you for that. So anybody who wants to check out, you are here at Kevin Gilbert Pro, uh, Podcast with Wayne Perez uh, as the host of that, as well as if you want to check out in, uh, some of the recently put together releases, such as The Giraffe, uh, wallet set as well as the call me Kai set they can go to with pop plus one correct.com to yeah I mean Kevin Gilbert.com takes you there and go to the buy link and all that stuff pop plus one is just it's it's just a small label that carries Kevin Gilbert stuff I mean it's all run by the same people but it's just 
I'll run there. Right. And, and he, as well, there is the Kevin Gilbert official Facebook page for anybody who wants to uh, chat with Kevin Gilbert fans, check out any uh, latest release news and whatnot. Uh, it's all on there. Correct. Yes, exactly. Max. Well, I'm looking forward to what comes next when I really appreciate you giving me all this time to talk about this. I know I only had said 30 minutes, but uh, I, I really appreciate that. Seriously. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here.